Hello and welcome to First Wave Cloud Technologies Q2 FY21 Investor Update. My name is Neil Pollock and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of First Wave. Joining me today is our Executive Chairman, John Grant, and our Chief Finance Officer, Ian Bartram. Please note the disclaimer on slide two. Moving to slide three, our objective today is to report First Wave's unaudited Q2 and half one FY21 results and update you on Q3. The presentation you're now seeing has been lodged on the ASX portal and emailed to the address provided with your registration. During the presentation, we will refer to the slide number we are talking to. The presentation will commence with an update from John I'll follow with the Q2 and H1 results, and then I'll provide an update on Q3. Following my summary, we'll open the lines for Q&A. Before we get into it, I wanna remind you that there is additional content and detail in the appendix, which expands on the main presentation and includes a description of our technology and an investor's guide to our acronyms. I invite you to review the entire slide deck at your leisure and raise any questions you have with us directly today or via email. Let's move on to slide four and the chairman's update. Good morning, John. Over to you, please. Thanks, Neil, and welcome to everyone on the call. Let's move on to slide five. Neil will elaborate on all of what I'm now about to say, but in summary, in the first half, total revenue was up on plan and recurring re revenue was on plan with domestic above and international below plan. The continuing impact of COVID-19 on our partners, particularly in EMEA and India, continued into Q2, not unexpectedly lowering the rate of growth in international revenues. But while we expect COVID to remain with us through the second half, as I've said repeatedly, this is a numbers game and we have got many irons in the fire around the world. Expenses remained in line with plan in the first half and the closing cash balance was $1.4 million ahead. But there are many inputs to cash and we're watching margins, payment flows from partners and foreign exchange. Neil will talk at length. But early indicators are positive. Please turn to slide six and I'll hand you over to Neil who will now add more colour to all of this. Thank you, John. I'm now moving to slide seven. Before we get into the results, I think this is an important slide because we use a lot of revenue metrics in this business and they're used throughout this presentation today. At times it can be quite confusing. So let me take a couple of minutes to explain some of the terms. Firstly, MRR, monthly recurring revenue. This is revenue flowing from monthly subscriptions, normally ranging between three and six months that we have with end users. NRR is non-recurring revenue. This is revenue flowing from one-off professional services engagements with our partners and on occasions end user customers. This is project type revenue. ARR, annualized recurring revenue. At the end of each month, the annualized value of the subscriptions is reported as the total value of subscriptions in that month, the MRR, multiplied by 12. Now we report MRR, NRR and ARR separately for international partners as IMRR, IARR and INRR and our domestic partners as DMRR, DARR, and DNRR. TR stands for total revenue in any month, quarter, or year, and is the sum of the MRR and NRR for each month in that respective period. Okay, with that in mind, let me get into the Q2 key metrics and move to slide eight. Although performance across the Q2 key metrics was a bit mixed, importantly, total revenue grew 3% quarter on quarter and was on plan. 
while domestic recurring revenue was up 6%, international recurring revenue took the brunt of the impact of, from COVID-19 continuing in the quarter, and its rate of growth quarter on quarter was lowered to 33%, which is 26% down on plan. Non-recurring revenue was minimal, as you can see, and it's not a metric we give any significant focus to, but its shortfall to plan combined with the shortfall in international recurring revenue saw quarter on quarter total revenue decline 2% or 5% down on plan. With product mix favoring lower margins uh, in EPP and email and a shift in the domestic and international revenue ratio away from that in the plan, gross product margin for the quarter was under plan. We are mindful in reporting this that some of the invoices we get from our technology partners for the licenses they provide us do not necessarily follow revenue timing and that gross product margin is uh, a, a more accurate the longer time period over which it is measured. Closing cash was 1.39 million ahead of plan and 8.08 .08 million at 8.08 .08 million and we added nine billing partners in the quarter. We now have 46 billing partners. These are partners that are generating recurring revenue. I'm on to slide nine now. If there is one key metric indicative of the health of this business, it's our annualized recurring revenue and how it trends over time. Slide nine is a quarter on quarter view of this over the last seven quarters. What it shows is that Q2 total annualized recurring revenue actually grew 5% quarter on quarter, albeit below plan. International annualized recurring revenue grew 16% quarter on quarter to break the $1 million mark in a month for, for the first time. And importantly, domestic annualized recurring revenue grew 4% quarter on quarter to $6.51 million. This is the first quarter on quarter growth in domestic recurring revenue in five quarters. Critically, for your company, Q2 FY21 is the first quarter in the company's history that both international and domestic revenue grew. This is a positive trend which we expect to continue despite the current operating environment. I'm now moving to slide 10. The Q2 cash balance was $1.39 million ahead of plan at 8.08 .08 million. The company received 2.06 million in R&D refund from the Australian government in early January, lifting the cash balance at the start of Q3 to $10.14 million. You may have noted from the 4C that cash used in the quarter was higher than in Q1. So let me just deal with that for a second. This is a result of changes in a supplier financing agreement with a major customer, which has impacted the timing, but not the quantum of the payments from this customer and several new billing partners being onboarded, we onboarded nine in Q2, where the establishment of billing and reconciliation processes delayed invoicing and collections. Finally, on Q2, financing activities of 0.31 million in the quarter were due to sub underwriter options being exercised. Okay, I'm now going to re review the half one results and provide a regional uh, update. And I'm moving on now to slide 12. On balance, the half one performance was solid and underpinned by growth in total revenue, diligent management of expenses, as you'd expect, and a careful watch on cash. This has positioned your company for further growth into the second half. Let me pick the highlights out of this. COVID-19 impacted performance beyond Q1, as you've seen. To date, we estimate the impact is deferral of around $248,000 in annualized recurring revenue, but we still have many irons in the fire and it is the rate of growth which has been impacted, not the compounding revenue growth itself per se. On the product front, we continue ex to expand our product portfolio, onboarding a new technology partner, Simplified Systems Limited out of the UK and launching their WebProtect DNS product to deliver first revenues in December. We also delivered two major product features in the half to ensure we maintain product leadership. We now have 13 platforms deployed up from 11 at June, 2020. And our first on-premise platform outside Australia is in production in the Middle East. 
we now have traffic flowing on platforms on five continents. On revenue, we closed the half 5% ahead of plan with total revenue of $4.07 million. Our total annualized recurring revenue closed 6% below plan at $7.51 million due to the international annualized recurring run rate uh, under achievement in Q2. Growth in the domestic annualized recurring revenue, DAR, which was 2% ahead of plan at $6.51 million, partially offset the international uh, revenue, which was down on plan, but at 1.01 million. Um, I just wanna say that that 1.01 million is up 125% from the June 2020 exit. The cash balance at the half was the same as the Q2 exit and we added 20 billing partners in the half and Cisco's sales efforts have positioned us stronger than ever in major global accounts with significant advances in particular being seen in North America late in the half. TART TTL is now selling a full suite of our products in India, but on the other end of the spectrum, DWS in the UK has been seriously impacted by COVID with their sales teams remaining furloughed. I'm now gonna go into a regional update and I'm moving to slide 13, which is the regional review of EMEA. Let's look at what happened in each region. You'll recall our VP business development sales, Sundar Bharadwaj, who is based out of the UK, leads this region where the business conditions have remained significantly restricted. The UK and Europe are now into another round of lockdowns and business activity after emerging positively in Q1, effectively returned to the conditions we saw in the second half of last financial year. Yet, despite all this, at the end of the half, EMEA has become the largest region by partners and the second largest region uh, in revenue behind ANZ. Half one annualized recurring revenue growth was 71%. This is largely because Africa and the Middle East are showing signs of recovery. Our on-premise deployment in the Middle East is on track and the launch of the new Web Protect DNS product delivered immediate revenue in December. This has partially offset the delays in converting level two partners in Europe to revenue and the signing of the new level one partner in Africa has been delayed until Q3. Let's move to slide 14, APAC. In APAC, we are cautious but encouraged as the region looks to be emerging from the impact of COVID-19. A reminder that India and Asia are covered by both Sunda and your other VP business development and sales, Shakila Ramalingam, where we have the level one partners, Vodafone Idea, VI and TTL. They are the prime drivers of revenue in this region over time, but there are many smaller but very important partners that have collectively delivered 73% growth in annualized recurring revenue over the half to reach $0.24 million. In this region, we signed a new level partner in Altel out of Malaysia, but the signing of the new level one partner, which was planned in Indonesia, has been delayed into Q3. We're in the process of recruiting an additional BD and sales resource to take advantage of an emerging opportunity with a major telco and the Malaysian government, which has announced almost half a billion dollars US funding to bolster cybersecurity in the country. Let's move to slide 15. Cisco. Cisco takes our platform to market globally as the Cisco Security Management Platform, CSMP. Greg Barron, our Director of Global Alliances and I jointly manage our, our relationship with Cisco with the support of our pre-sales engineering team. Late in the half, we created an exclusively focused Cisco partner team with a specific mandate to turn current contracts into revenue and accelerate growth with Cisco. In the first half, 13 Cisco partners build- Excuse me, Neil, can I just interrupt? Sorry to interrupt, but the slides sure. showing ANZ I beg Thank your you. pardon, Tom. I think it's the previous one. Uh, no. I think you're talking to a slide that's not in the pack. Okay, I will sort yeah, that out. Apologies, everyone. Go, keep talking now. Sure. Um, 
So in half one, 13 Cisco partners build $0.27 million of annualised recurring revenue, which is up over 1,200% from June. Opportunity development in the Cisco uh, region continues. The Middle East opportunity has been delivered. And although revenue growth has been below expectations, our partnership has resulted in Cisco being selected as the preferred supplier to a global tier one telco in North America. I'm now moving to ANZ. ANZ is our largest region by revenue, delivering $6.51 million of annualised recurring revenue in the first half, led by Shaquilla and managed by Greg and the Australian-based business development and channels team. In this region, Telstra appears to have returned to growth as churn appears to have stabilised. It could still be lumpy as we enter the second half, but the team is focused on continuing to deliver growth in the domestic market. Negotiations on renewal of the Telstra Preferred Supplier Agreement are also underway. Revenue flow from the TBCSS, the Telstra Business Cybersecurity Suite program has been disappointing due entirely to the reallocation of the Telstra team responsible for driving sales to COVID-19 related tasks. Telstra has stated TBCSS is due for relaunch this month and we are watching that keenly. There is positive momentum from the newly engaged channel partner development lead and as a major input to cash flow, the annual advance payment, which was scheduled to arrive this month, has been commuted to a monthly payment. Let me now move on to the Q3 update. I'm now on slide 18. Taking into account the experience of Q2, we see the Q3 operating environment has what the chairman referred to as a few balls in the air. I wanna talk briefly about what's changed between June 2020 when we announced our FY21 plan and now as we enter Q3. I'm gonna do this in terms of revenue, margins and cash. In June, we said a key assumption of the FY21 plan was that business would be back to doing business at pre-COVID levels by the start of Q2. That's clearly not happened. And as I've mentioned a number of times already today, COVID is still present and impacting our partners and their revenues. I also mentioned briefly a few slides ago, a few slides ago that we projected our average product gross margin would improve to 59% driven by product mix. That is higher volumes of firewalls and web security. And by revenue mix, an increasing proportion of international revenue, particularly through Cisco in the overall revenue mix. Today, what we see is higher sales of email and endpoint protection products, which is totally expected in a COVID business world, and a lower ratio of international to domestic revenue. Both of these factors put pressure on our margins and we're keeping a close watch on this. On the cash front, although the half one performance has been strong, Q3 will be impacted by two factors. Firstly, the domestic customer annual prepayment, which I've previously mentioned, and projected in February has been commuted to a monthly payment in arrears. Again, let me stress, the revenue has not gone, but it will now come monthly rather than annually in advance. And secondly, as international revenue grows as a percentage of overall revenue, the impact of any decline in US dollar and Great British Pound to the Australian dollar ratio will be felt more keenly. Clearly, this impacts both revenue and expenses, but it was not part of our projections from June 2020. I wanna stress that these call outs are not excuses. They point to the reality of our operating environment and we're expecting to be dealing with them throughout the second half. You'll see in a minute, however, that we're not just sitting around waiting for it to go away. And what we're doing has already had positive impact on our Q3 revenue. Okay, with the scene set, I'm now going to move on to slide 19 to update you on what we are doing about this right now. Firstly, we've proactively moved to expand the product portfolio to give our BD and sales teams more options for our partners. We've brought on a new technology partner with a new web cybersecurity offering called Web Protect DNS, as I mentioned earlier, and we've already secured first revenues out of Africa. We've redirected, we've also redirected the development effort, our development effort to meet new opportunities emerging under the Cisco OEM agreement. And secondly, we're growing and pivoting our go-to-market team by expanding our Cisco account team with a focus on turning existing partner contracts into revenue, recruiting a new partner account manager domestically to bring on new partners in ANZ, and accelerating our new Web Protect DNS offering into all markets. 
I'm now moving to slide 20. Q3 has started well, and I'm confident revenue growth can accelerate. A positive early indicator is that compared to December, we've seen a 38.5% uplift in international annualized recurring revenue to $1.39 million in January in a single month. This has lifted the total annualized recurring revenue by 5% in one month. Domestic revenue has remained flat, which is not unexpected given the Christmas New Year season in Australia. But importantly, our international revenue now makes up 18% of the total annualized recurring revenue base. This was 3% just 12 months ago. Now, what you'll not see on this slide is a Q3 total revenue outlook for March. And that is for all the reasons that I've just spoken to. We're not trying to avoid the issue. The facts are there are simply too many balls in the air for us to be able to accurately forecast at this time. I can imagine you'll have a number of questions about this and we will get to the Q&A session very soon. But let me try and answer some of the more obvious ones now. Firstly, do I believe we can still make our plan? Well, in this regard, we are all dealing with an operating environment that is being driven by macro factors that are unique, hard to predict and variable, and are having a wide range of impacts across partners, end customers and geographies. We've referred to having many irons in the fire Clearly, this refers to the number of opportunities that exist with our partners across these multiple geographies. These have a spread of potential sales revenue outcomes and timing that is hard to predict with confidence given the current operating environment. But what is clear is that there is more business on foot each month. The opportunity pipeline is strong. And while the rate of revenue growth slowed in QT, Q2, January has given us and should give you some comfort. The bottom line, however, is that in order to confidently answer this question, we need to see the actions we are taking play out and that will take a little more time. So you might then ask, right, oh, so how does this impact on cash? As we said earlier, there are a lot of variables to cash, but what we do know is we're $1.4 million ahead of plan at the half and there are both positives and negatives to our planned cash flow, which have and will continue to occur. We are tightly and conservatively managing how we apply your cash, and we've diverted some of that cash to activities we believe will give us more positive outcomes in the short term. But again, in order to answer the cash question, some of the inputs such as sales mix, margins, foreign exchange and payments need to firm up to give us greater clarity. So it would be perfectly understandable now for you to say, that's not very helpful, Neil, and then ask, so when can you give us clarity? And the answer to this question is as soon as we can. We will constantly, being review, we will constantly be reviewing the situation as you'd expect and respectable of your investment in first wave and in the spirit of transparency that we've always sought to give you, we will report to you monthly during Q3. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground this morning and there's a lot of information in this presentation. So let me summarize the key takeouts. Please move to slide 22. Revenue is growing. International revenue is growing fast. The rate of growth has been lower than projected, but the outlook for Q3 is for this to improve. The reality is, as we've said, that we face a macro environment that, that is directly impacting the timing and extent of the realization of these opportunities, but the revenue is growing. Costs are in line with plan and are expected to remain so in Q3. Cash is ahead of plan and the Q3 outlook for cash remains positive. So on balance, the outlook is positive. H1 has given us good momentum and January revenue has closed strongly. International annualized recurring revenue up 38.5% on December, as I said. So we will report progress to you monthly during Q3 as the balls continue to land. I thank you for your attention. We will now open the line for questions.
Neil, we do have one question. Please. Yep. Um, with a miss in international annualised reoccurring revenue for December quarter, how does that change your forecast for the 9.5 million international annualised re revenue for the June quarter 21? Okay, so I think I have, uh, in fact, I've tried to address that um, during the presentation uh, in talking about, do we believe we can still make our plan? Um, and I'd, I'd just refer to the, re the response to that question that I gave uh, preemptively, I think, in the, in the presentation. Um, uh, we've got a number of irons in the fire, fire in a challenging operating environment. Um, you know, the, the, the opportunities have a spread of potential sales revenue outcomes and timing. The, the, the challenge with making a definitive statement about this is that uh, it's hard to predict with confidence given the current operating environment. Um, and so in order to build the picture, um, we are going to, uh, we're going to uh, report back to you on a monthly basis during this quarter. The thing that I would say is that I, I note that the reference for that is that the, the miss on international annualized recurring revenue in, um, at the, in December, when in Q2, uh, um, the, the reason it's difficult to predict is because um, if you look at the growth that's occurred in a single month in January, um, which basically got us to 1.39, 1.4 million dollars of international annualized occurring revenue, which is where, you know, we, we told the market we thought we would be at the end of December. It, the, vari the variables are just uh, are just too great at the moment for me to be able to make a definitive comment about that. So now let me jump into that as well. Um, what we have said, however, is that this is clearly. Um, top of mind for us, and we'll be reviewing it ongoing. But we'll share as much as we know monthly with shareholders. We can't do better than that. Um, and that's success. So you will know when we know. And as soon as we, we feel that we've got enough certainty, we will tell you definitively where we think we will end up. Thank you. We've got another question. With current cash burn, what steps are being taken to bend the needle upwards? And if the cash burn does not become positive within the next six months, what steps will be taken to maintain solvency? Um, I, I, so I think the, the not I think, our uh, update to the market in June last year uh, advised that we expected to be um, cash flow positive uh, by December or uh, 2022. So I think I've also tried to uh, address that particular uh, question and the impact on, on cash in the, uh, in the preemptive questions as well. Um, there are a lot of variables to our cash position. Um, look, it's pleasing that we're ahead of plan at the half by, uh, $1.4 million. Um, I think also the, although we've reported 8.08 .08 million uh, at the end of Q2, when you add in, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, when you add in the uh, R&D refund from the Australian government uh, at just over $2 million, um, it improves the cash position in, in, early, in, in early January and entering Q3. Look, we're, we're, as I've said in, the, in, in today's presentation, we're tightly, as you'd expect, we're tightly and conservatively managing how we apply that cash. Um, and we've also diverted some of the cash um, that might've been originally uh, planned for one particular area of the business into other activities, which we believe will give us more positive outcomes in the short term. And, and let, me, let me give you one example of that. Um, the simplified DNA, the simplified uh, systems limited uh, product, Web Protect DNS, was originally scheduled not until uh, Q4 of this uh, of this financial year. 
uh, when we saw what was happening with the persistence of, uh, of COVID and other operating environment impacts, um, we brought that forward. So we acted quickly in, uh, to uh, knowing that it, it, had, it had potential, um, instead of leaving it until Q4, we brought that forward into, uh, into Q2 uh, and, and in order to, to, to try and counter or offset the effectively the, the, the impact of COVID in, in UK and Europe, which is severe. Um, and that, that produced immediate results uh, in December and we generated revenue in December out of that product. So it's, we're, we're, we're doing everything that we can um, uh, to, to closely manage the cash situation. But I just wanna stress again, and I'm, probably John will say this if I don't, um, we're going, you know, to order answer that, in order to answer that question, some of the inputs such as sales mix, margins and forex, um, and, our, and our client customer payments need to firm up to give us greater clarity of it. So again, we will keep the market updated on a monthly basis in regards to the cash position. So just to add, that's, you know, I think that says everything completely, Neil. And just to add to that, clearly from a solvency point of view, if the situation changes and as we work ourselves through Q3, we get we make a determination that in fact the cash flow break even stage is not going to be reached when we said then we'll tell you and you know the opportunities for a company like First Wave is to raise money that's why we're in this business so that's why we're listed that's not to say anything about the fact that we're doing that but we do need to know what's happening so there's we've said numerous times on this call already and we are no different to almost every other business in the world. We're no different because we, we all need to see how these things play out. Um, by the end of Q3, we'll absolutely know. There's no question about that. And we can be definitive about it then. Thank you. We've got a question from Nick Harris. Hi, John and Neil. Well done to, to still grow in a tough quarter globally. You added more billing partners in Q2. Can you please talk a bit about what sort of partners they are, e.g. telcos, IT companies, and any other colour you can add on what or who they are selling your solutions to. Uh, look, thanks, Nick. Um, good morning to you. Uh, the partners vary. Um, I There are a, a couple of those new partners have come out of, as I've already talked about, one of them is a, is a telco. Uh, in Malaysia, if I go back to um, the, the regional update, um, there was a, a Altel out of out of Malaysia. Um, the, uh, the another a couple were, came out of our African business because or African Africa region uh, from EMEA. Um, we saw um, and, and India. Uh, we added one or two um, MSP. MSSP smaller partners uh, in that region. So it's, it, they vary, the partners that we're bringing on vary, Nick. But to and, add to that, I mean, that's consistent with our go-to-market model. But primary channel to market is through what we call level one partners, the majority of whom are, are large telcos. Um, however, amongst those, we've of course got Shelt and, and, and Dimension Data, both of whom are sort of large-scale systems integrators or managed security service providers. Um, but those channels to market then open to a whole range of other partners, the majority of whom, again, are smaller telcos, but it includes also distributors, as with DWS in the UK, and it includes resellers who sell directly to end-user customers. And the end-user customers, in terms of their profile, I mean, our, we're targeting our solutions um, in, in, through this channel network, primarily at small to medium business, Telstra's taken them to small office, home office, interestingly enough, and, and that is potentially and clearly a market opportunity for us, the way we package the, the platform and the offerings on it. Um, uh, and we are also playing into the um, upper end of SM, all the way up to the upper end of SMB. But as we've said before, because the platform hosts enterprise grade uh, uh, products, it appeals to all sorts of businesses, including all the way up to enterprise and government. And we don't, we don't address this channel in any, in any meaningful way at the moment, other than those which come across us across our, in, in our path, if you like, 
which we do on a direct basis. Um, but if a major telco introduces a major partner like that, then we bring them in. So it's a the benefit, the real attribute of this solution is that while we're targeting primarily SMB through, chat, through the telco channel, the applications themselves and the portfolio is applicable to all size businesses. And over time, of course, as we get more money to invest and we become more successful, um, we will open up these other channels using different go-to-market motions than the one we've got through telcos. So it's a, it's, a, it's a broad question, Nick. Hope that sort of satisfied it. There is a bit of description of this that we've produced in a document that I tabled in the last quarter update, which has been updated on an ongoing basis, which I'm happy to send you, which will elaborate a little bit further. We've got another question. So just to clarify, at the end of January 21, international annual reoccurring revenue is 1.3 million. And that's a question. Uh, it's actually 1.39. It's closer to 1.4 million. So yes, the uh, and let me be clear about this. So if you if you look at the MRR, and it's not. In fact, let me stop that. <laughs> let me take a pace back. The answer to the question is yes. Uh, international annualized recurring revenue at the end of January was 1.39 million dollars. So. Sorry, Sorry, so that was so December it was 1.01 million, January it's 1.39 million. Yes, that's a 40% increase in the month of January, and we needn't get too carried away with that, which we're not for all the reasons we've said, but it's a very strong indicator. The way I think, and, and I, it might be helpful if I say this to our, to our shareholders. Might be helpful to think of annualised recurring revenue as the money that you get at the start of each month before you open the doors. Mm -hmm. So we started February before we opened trading with one point three nine million dollars of revenue in the kit in the kick it would come into February. Then, therefore, anything that flows in addition to that through all the work we're doing in market adds to the one point three nine, and we'll close February with a higher number, and so mm -hmm. it goes on. So the point about annualised revenue is it's under contract between contracts of between three and 36 months and those contracts flow over that period. So they, we book them, we can book them every month. And that's this wonderful leverage channel model that we've been talking about now for a long time. We have a question from Mike Fiddler. I appreciate the difficult operating environment in the short term. Do you have a view on where you see the inflection point when channel partnerships grow exponentially out of fear of not having this service to offer their SMB clients when their competitors do. Would this be a measure of relationships established or is there a different measure we should focus our attention towards? Ruth, can you, I'm sorry, can you ask me that question? Yeah, Go back absolutely. and repeat the question, please. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the difficult, the difficult operating environment the short term, do you have a view on where you see the inflection point when channel partnerships grow exponentially out of fear of not having the service to offer their SMB clients when their competitors do? Yep. Would this be a measure of relationships? As, would this be a measure of relationships established, or is there a different measure we should focus our attention towards? It's a great question. Um, the let me deal with the inflection point first. I I think one of the things that COVID has done very clearly in this business environment in and we talked about this in previous presentations, where remote working accessing over the uh, accessing you know critical data over the, over the internet rather than under the you know the, a secure network enterprise network has certainly um, offered the opportunity to black hack black hat hackers to take advantage of the situation that clean pipe technology and secure internet connect connectivity, email security, uh, end device or endpoint security um, 
is hugely problematic across the globe. And in fact, um, you see it every day that um, the, the, the number of attacks, the number of companies being attacked, the, the acceleration that CIOs are, are embedding in their organizations in regards, digitization, moving to the cloud, got to get security. An example that I'll give you is an, is, uh, an, a, a, an implementation that we did with Voter Idea in India last quarter, where one of the world's largest, and I won't mention the company name, but one of the world's largest uh, IT services companies um, went for our pan next generation firewall um, solution because they were operating across two geographies. The data that was being accessed was in India and the company that was asset or the people who were accessing that data were in, in the United States. So th what they needed was, and the, and the challenge that they had was not only the protection of the data, but also the latency in the setup that they currently had to try and protect um, the access to that data. And we were able to provide that solution um, bespoke for them as it was um, in a manner that enabled them now, they're quite uh, satisfied with the reduction in latency and the protection that they get from an enterprise grade cybersecurity solution, such as a Palo Alto network firewall. So having said that, the inflection point, I wish I could, you know what, I wish I could predict the inflection point. Um, I think the inflection, I don't think there'll be a single inflection point. I think there is a, a gradual, well, not only gradual, a rapid and accelerating move towards total perimeter security. I think one of the things that has changed in answer to this question is that people now, or, or organizations now, businesses now, two things, businesses now don't just look for a single layer of security. So they're not just looking at email. They're not just looking at endpoint protection. They are looking at a suite of perimeter cybersecurity options to effectively multi-layer defenses against attack. And we're seeing that with TTL in India being able to sell our full suite of products, to be honest with you. They, they have sold email, web, firewalls, and endpoint protection to their customers. And, and they are responding directly to the, the needs of their customers. And it's one of the real strengths of the platform. And they're doing all of that off the AWS platform that we have, CCSP, the cloud content security platform that we have in, in Mumbai. Um, so I think it's, it's not so much an inflection point. I think it is more uh, a rapid move to multi-layered um, enterprise grade cybersecurity. The big advantage that we have is that our partners, whether they're telco, MSSP, MSP, whatever, systems integrators, are able to offer their customer base and their end customers um, of their own partners um, a full suite of products from a single platform. So they don't, you know, I've said this multiple times since I've been with the company. Um, First Wave is the only platform in the world that enables uh, a telco or, or an MSSP to offer that full suite of products from a, from a, a single platform and their enterprise grade products. So we're not designing our own email or our own firewall or our own web and competing with the Cisco's and the Palo Alto's and, and, and the Fortinet's. Let them do what they're best at and they do because they're the best in the world at it but let us multi-tenant and, and, and integrate them and enable our partners to offer them. That's, that is the, the, you know, the, 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 the key uh, benefit of, uh, of what we do with our platform and no one else does it. So I don't know whether there's going to be a, an inflection point. I believe that we will continue to see accelerated and rapid digitization and move towards multi-layer perimeter security. I hope that answers that question. Neil, you covered a lot of geography in that. Um, maybe <laughs> Mike, I'll just sharpen a bit of that up. Um, yeah. We spoke, we spoke, started talking 18 months ago about the path to revenue. 
And we identified the nine steps in that path to revenue from first making contact with a tier one partner to finally selling the a billing partner more, more solutions from our portfolio. Um, it's, a, it's referenceable on previous updates, and but if it's not clear to you, just send us an email and we can send you a copy of that. That's the first point. The data that you should be looking at is the data that we, we believe indicates exactly what you're asking. And the first of that is how many partners do we have? What, how many, what's the number of relationships? The second is how many billing partners do we have? Because once a partner starts billing, you can start to build momentum. And as Neil reported, 46 of those in at the end of Q2, up from 26, um, uh, up from 26 at the start of the first quarter. So 20 we've already added this year. So the more people you have in the marketplace who are talking, talking to, uh, building, pro building products with, taking to market through their marketing campaigns, then the greater is the opportunity for you to connect to the end customer and get revenue. Um, and the other measure is how our, particularly our, well, our recurring revenues in general, but more particularly our international recurring revenues, how they trend over time. And there was a com very complete information in the pack this morning about the trend of growth of international revenue. And that was topped off by the January 40% increase over the previous month. But that's where you should look to see wh where inflections are being created. That to me is the most valuable piece of information. Um, you, you asked whether that's a around the, the, a measure of the relationships established and through the channel network, it clearly is. I hope that that adds a, a, a bit more context to what Neil has covered. Well, it makes it crisper. Thanks, John. <laughs> We've got two more questions. There's a, a question from Peter Davis. Bringing forward the DNS product may well have assisted in the short term, but does that now leave a vacuum in quarter four? No, is the sort of short answer to that question. Uh, no, it's it's it was brought. It was going to be brought on anyway. It was there to as part of the bridge to to H two revenues. Um, what we've done is we've brought forward the potential opportunity that it delivers. Um, and we, as I said, we've already seen that with uh, revenue coming in December, additional revenue or incremental revenue coming in January. Um, no, so no. In fact, that does the converse because every new product we bring to market starts with no revenue and grows over time. So by bringing forward um, uh, Simplified DNS, the, simple, the Web Protect solution, um, we've actually brought the revenue forward and the growth in revenue forward. So in fact, it'll have a greater impact on Q4 than it has on Q1, Q, uh, sorry, Q3. Yeah. John, you mentioned the benefit of being listed and raising cash again later if needed. After arguably two very encouraging quarters, what is being done to raise the profile of the business and attract new shareholders? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good question. Um, don't know who the attendee is, but a very good question. And we've been working very hard at this with frankly very limited resources. Um, I mean, it comes down to me and Neil and, and um, Damien Filke, who's our marketing manager and some people he's got in his team who cover, who cover, and we've got, so we've got multiple areas, if you like, that we're addressing the first in terms of public relations, building the sort of branding of the company. We're out through all the social channels, as you imagine, we've got now the ability to be able to talk directly with um, journalists within the major publications so that when there are features coming up and you may have seen we participated as part of a feature in the in Q2. Um, we're, so we're, we're pursuing that sort of channel if you like um, and, and there's no doubt that we're gaining traction in that channel to be seen to be um, one of the players if you like. We've got a long way to go. That's the first thing and, and it needs more time and it needs frankly more investment which we haven't got money to do. So that's the first part of it. The second part is in terms of appealing more broadly to the investment community. You know, our market cap is now sort of around the hundred million dollars, up and up and down around that hundred million dollars. But the stronger the market cap, the more intention, more attention you get. And clearly, um, all of our investors would understand that there are a lot of funds around that don't even look at organisations if they're below hundred million dollars market cap. So. So long as so long as we can stay above a hundred million dollar cap, I think we start to get the real opportunity to engage with funds that we're not currently engaged with, and we're actively working that um, directly and with our advisors. So, and we'll do as much as we can in that area. Um, but it's a very competitive market at the moment, as you know. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's uh, come to IPO in this last quarter. 
Um, you know, how that will fare, we'll find out over the next couple of quarters, like all companies. Um, but we're, so we're doing, we're doing the things that we can do um, through, our, through the channels to the, um, the trade media, through the channels to the broad financial media and through the market itself by virtue of our direct representations. Um, and as I say, we're having some success, but we could do with a lot more investment in that area. Hmm. Are there any further questions? That's it, there's no further questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, let me now go to slide. 24. Uh, and I hand back to you to close, John. Thanks very much, Neil. Before we do close, I need to let you know that long-term non-executive director Scott Lidget has informed us of his need to step down from the board. Scott was a co-founder of First Wave Cloud Technology Limited in 2002 and has been a continuous board member for over 15 years, chairing the business on three separate occasions, including the period prior to our listing on the ASX. Scott has let us know that his full-time energies are now required in IPSEC, a business he founded in 2017. Scott's contribution over the time I've been chair and I presume since day one has been enormous. He's brought a perspective on the technology and how it plays into our partners and end customers businesses that has significantly influenced our product and go-to-market strategies. And he's also contributed his real world experience of building businesses from scratch. Scott has indicated he will remain a shareholder and interested party and to give effect to this, he's agreed to continue as a member of our technology and markets committee. But for me, the best thing is that he said as leaving, as he was leaving, that he is confident in the team we have assembled to deliver on the promise. We can ask no more than that from a founder and continuing shareholder. Thank you very much, Scott. And ladies and gentlemen, that closes the call. Thank you very much for listening and for your continuing interest. If you've got any questions, email, email us and we'll talk again very soon. Thank you and good morning.